I'm really excited for this one because uh, if you can't tell, I am very bullish on podcasting <laughs> and uh, I'm constantly telling young people my age to create podcasts, um, you know, not just to share content, but it's a great networking opportunity. It's a great way to build credibility, build, build your brand. So uh, the theme for this episode is going to be why 20 something should create a podcast. So um, before we dive into that, though, we have to start at the beginning. Um, so I'm curious of one routine that you developed in your early twenties, one routine that you still use today. Oh, it's so funny. You should say that. Cause there's one that I'm such a big advocate of, and your generation is going to be very uncomfortable with this one, uh -oh. which is pulling out an actual pen and paper and writing a to-do list every day. Something about that connection of handwriting a to-do list is much better than typing it on a computer or on your phone there's less of a mind connection to when you're writing it. And I tell everybody every morning, I have a legal pad. I don't have it in this room right now, but I write out what I want to do in the order that I feel I can get it accomplished. So obviously to a, there's a great feeling of when you cross off lists. I don't know if you've ever read the atomic habits, something about crossing something off a list gives you a, a feeling of accomplishment. And I have a list of a to-do list. It's always about 15, 20 things on my list. Certain things are there for a very long time but still they'll, they'll eventually get knocked off. And the idea is every morning, sorry, every night before I go to bed, I write that to-do list in the order that I feel I can accomplish it the next day. And I start that list and I get as much of it as I can done. And I redo that list the next day and redo that list the next day. And just having the act of a to-do list, I think is a great way to figure out how to map out the following day. I think that's wonderful advice. I agree that a lot of 20 somethings are not going to want to hear that, but I think that that's great advice because I currently do that, um, or at least a little iteration of it. Um, I do a thing uh, with the company that I work with, a media company called uh, our start of day, end of day. So every single morning mm -hmm. early, you know, in our large group chat as a company, you know, we'll write the bullet points of the things that we plan on doing that day. Uh, we don't have to hit every single one, but these are just the ones that, you know, we uh, at least are planning to do on Monday, Tuesday, mm -hmm. whatever day it is. And then at the end of the day, we write another little list of bullet points of the things that we actually did. Um, I think it's very helpful, not just, you know, as a company internally to see, you know, what everybody else accomplished for that day, but it really helps me. I mean, if I kind of lose track of what I need to do or forget, you know, what right. tasks, I could just reference that. Um, and that's but, an important you know, thing about it is that so many things happen in our lives, especially nowadays with instant communication and instant gratification and all that crap is that you get sidetracked and all of a sudden, you know, you're, especially nowadays you're working from home and oh, wow, Reacher is a new show I want to watch. And before you know it, two or three hours have gone by and you forgot what you were even supposed to do. So to have that to-do list to reference is an amazing thing. And the other thing I say that I, a lot of people think it's, it's wrong, but I totally think it's the right way to start your day. Make your damn bed. The first thing you do when you wake up in the morning, that sense of accomplishment that you made your bed, it starts your day out right. Those two things are things that I'm a big advocate of. I love that. And he's been doing this since his 20s and it's helped him <laughs> become successful. So yeah, those are the cheat codes right there. Um, so Ralph, obviously, I mean, you've accomplished so much in the podcasting space. Um, you know, you've built a podcast network with 22 shows and over 5 million listeners a month, mm -hmm. but you started as a radio DJ. You chose to leave terrestrial radio for the podcasting world. Talk to me about your early professional journey in radio. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll do you one better, by the way. I started out as a strip club DJ, uh, which is wow. even funnier. <laughs> but before that, I was actually a nightclub DJ. So I really kind of covered all of them because each one is a very, very different skill set. So it's very interesting that I, I can tweak the differences between a nightclub DJ, a strip club DJ, a radio DJ, and a podcasting uh, host. They're all very, very different. But radio I started in, it's funny, when I was a strip club DJ, I was miserable at one point. In the beginning, when I was in, in my early 20s, when I started doing that, it sounded great. You know, there's, there's gorgeous girls, there's, there's good money. Could have It was an exciting time for me as a young kid. But a few years later, I was miserable and I was looking for a way out. And a friend of a friend started working at my club as a strip club DJ, and he was a radio DJ. And we started talking. I said, I'll teach you this. You get me an audition there. And I started working overnights, midnight to six in the morning for $6 an hour, two hours from my house by, by car, because I wanted to be a radio DJ. That's how badly I wanted to do it. So much so that I was also working in, in a... a restaurant at the time. I had gone to cooking school and I was running a restaurant and I'd work midnight to six in the morning in radio, drive two hours 
to start my morning shift at the restaurant and work from eight in the morning till four in the afternoon. I would stay straight up through the night to the next day. Every week, I would do that two nights a week to go through that. I was like, you know, up for almost 40 hours. It was crazy. But um, I wanted to be a radio DJ. And I started that, did that overnight for a little while, turned that into a syndicated radio show that at one point I was up to almost 100 stations. I don't want to bore you with the details, but I figured it all out on my own. I figured out what a syndication, what a syndicated show meant by finding discarded syndicated packages in the studio. I just copied it and made it look like we were ready for syndication and sent it out to other places. I faked it the whole way. And then that show got built to almost 100 stations. But about six, seven years ago, I started to realize nobody cared about radio anymore. It was very obvious that your generation wasn't listening to radio. And the way I found out about it was when I was hosting events, I used to be, oh, my God, it's Ralph from Tour Bus Radio. We got to bring this guy straight through. But by year seven, eight, or nine of doing radio, it wasn't me that they cared about anymore. It was a YouTuber. It was a podcaster. It was a web radio guy. And me, even though I probably had a much bigger reach, it was just the next thing. Everybody wanted to be part of that. So a friend of mine offered me to do a podcast with him when I was hosting this rock festival on a boat called Ship Rock. And I had the worst response. I said, dude, podcasting is for people that can't do radio. I'm doing radio. So thank you, but no thank you. But then over the course of that year, I started reading about how important radio podcasting was. So the next year I said to him, if you're still interested, I'll do it with you. And that was almost seven years ago, we started a podcast. And I remember saying, as a, as a, imagine if I could get a thousand people to listen to this show, that would be amazing. Now I would kill myself if I only had a thousand listeners, you know, but <laughs> it was amazing what a difference a few years could make. And that became very quickly started making as much money, if not more in podcasting as it was in radio as I was doing them both at the same time for about two years. And then slowly transitioned to let the radio show go focus on the podcast, and then start the podcast network, which is now about five years old. That's awesome. I want to break down a few things that you mentioned there from the very beginning. You know, you, I love the point that you made where the strip club, DJ to podcasting, three very different things, but you kind of backpacked the skills. You took the skills from each one uh, before you pivoted and kind of, you know, said, okay, I gained this skill from this this from this, and this is going to help me become more successful from that. So I think that 10, 20, something that's looking to pivot into a new industry, um, try something new. That's fine. You know, it can be a, com a complete 180, but at least, you know, really reflect with yourself about what you previously did and which skills you can take to the next one. Um, I love your point also about, you know, you were trying to get into radio and you had to sacrifice a lot to do that because it wasn't paying as well as it should have at the very beginning. Right. Um, but you knew, you know, you really had a passion for this. And that's another great lesson of 20 somethings. You, know, you got to sacrifice to do the things that you really want. Um, right. Never go into something, you know, just wanting to get paid for it right away. I mean, you got to build a brand, you got to build consistency. Um, you know, you got to you know, you got to build a presence in whatever that is. It doesn't have to be a podcast. It can be anything. Um, and if you don't do it for the money right away, I mean, things will end up surprising you later I on. I tell people all the time, if you think you're doing it for the money from the beginning, you're in the wrong business. Like you should do it because you love doing it and worry about money down the road. But another thing, the, a lesson that I learned very early on, hilariously, it came from uh, the strip clubs, but it, it carried through to what every, every venue I've been in, every, every venture since. Go in knowing, oh, I'm going to be bad at this. I'm going, there's no one, that, very rarely, I'm sure there are, they do exist, where you pick a, a vocation and you're just a natural and you knock it out of the park day one. Most people are not going to be that. You are going to be bad at first and accept that and just enjoy the fact that you're learning. You're going to get better. We're all, we're all, we all have the ability to be A students. We all have the ability to be great at almost anything. Of course, there's certain limitations. If you're 5'4", you're probably not going to make it to the NBA. There's certain things that are going to be limitations. But in terms of skill sets, like you can just always get better. You could be a much better ba basketball player than you started at at 5'4". You may not make it to the NBA, but you may become 100 times better than you were when you started. So in radio, the first season, like the first season, the first few episodes of my old radio show, I still have them taped. I was horrible. I listened to the early episodes of the podcast. They were laughable, but you keep working at it and you get better and you accept that it's okay to be bad at something. It's okay that people are not going to enjoy it right away. But I, my lesson I tell to everybody that wants to get into podcasting is 
Start listening back to those first episodes that you record. If you can't make it through the full episode of yourself, nobody's going to listen. So you got to learn to get to the point where you actually enjoy listening to yourself. That's, that's a great point that you made. I and, mean, you know, I, this is a podcast this is my podcast right here in their twenties. I remember when I started it with, uh, you know, Michael, it was very difficult, you know, to ask questions, especially, you know, find chemistry when having a co-host and it's, it's, everybody thinks podcasting is super easy. You know, it's just a natural conversation. It took us a while to get pretty comfortable in the space. And I still have a long ways to go. You, you keep growing over time. Um, so my question now is, uh, you know, what resources did you use specifically? could be books, newsletters, whatever, you know, other podcasts that you stream when you were getting into the podcasting space. And then I'll even add another one to that. What resources would you direct current 20 somethings um, to look at if they're interested in getting into the podcasting space? Well, I will start by saying what's great is because it is a super hot technology, it's getting easier and easier. If you look back at when I started and you had to create your own RSS feed, you had to figure out a way to deliver that RSS. You had to submit manually to every platform. You don't have to do anything like that anymore. There are apps that make it super easy. An app like Anchor makes it super, super easy, right? What I, the, the best thing you can do is just pull out your phone and hit record and then listen back to yourself. You don't even need to worry about anything else yet. Just see if you would be interested in recording a few episodes on your own. Every phone has a recorder built in. You already have the ability to do a podcast. It's not going to sound great. It's not going to have video, but you can hit record and just talk with your friend. Do whatever you think you can do and then listen back and think, do I enjoy this? That's number one. Number two, all I did, which was, it was archaic at the time, but it was the only resource I could think of was I went on Reddit and I joined the subreddits. I went on Facebook and I joined the Facebook groups. You know, there was no... Uh, Real, I mean, there was Instagram, but barely. There was no other real resources. You know, the school of Google and YouTube is a very powerful school. You could pretty much learn anything doing that. You know, that makes every, any problem, any issue you've ever had, there's a YouTube video about how to fix it. That's for sure, right? So that's the best way to do it. And I think that what I can't teach anybody is the passion to do it. So to me, that's your first thing. Can I record an episode a week for a month, and I'm still interested. If you are, then you could start worrying about all the rest of it. But I think most people don't even get to that step. They don't, they love the idea of a podcast. They want to start with 100,000 listeners and making money and just show up and everything's taken care, for, taken care of for them. It doesn't work that way. I wrote, uh, I was interviewed by Entrepreneur Magazine two years ago on how to start a podcast for next to no money. So if you go to entrepreneur.com, I just put my name in, Ralph Sutton, you'll see that article. A, they interviewed me a couple of times, but the one, How to Start a Podcast for Next to No Money, is a great one. It's, even though it's two years old, 80% of that is still valuable. If anything, all those resources are even easier now. So that's what I would suggest people to do. Uh, yeah, I really, really relate to something that you said that, uh, you know, it isn't for everybody. And like, I want everybody to make a podcast because I've become so passionate about it. I'm obsessed over this uh, medium. But you know, at the end of the day, it's not going to be for everybody. Uh, I came across a pretty interesting statistic a few months ago that 90% of podcasters quit after episode three. And I understand why it's because mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, you want to make the money right away. It's very difficult to get on guests. If you have a podcast that's featuring guests, create content, create ideas. I get it. It's not going to be for everybody, but at least try it, you know, give it a shot, uh, see if it is for you, because you can get a lot of value from creating a podcast. What we spoke about earlier off air, you know, you could build a network, you can really get in the same room with a lot of interesting people, build online credibility, uh, leverage a podcast to get another job. I mean, there are so many things right. you can do to do uh, to get started in podcasting. I've had a What's chance it? to read your um, article in Entrepreneur, uh, the one that you mentioned about um, how to start a podcast with little to no money. We're going to link it to the interview as well, because it's a great resource. But if you could just break down a few of the points in that article that you believe are still relevant today, as you mentioned, that'd be super yeah, helpful. Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, as I said, there are so many uh, free resources that I, I first believe, though, you should never be beholden to other people, meaning you should learn some basic audio editing. You should learn how to submit your files online. They're all very easy now, right? There's, there's resources like Libsyn or, or, or um, Blueberry or Anchor. These are hosting sites for your audio file, right? So your audio file, so the neophytes that are listening that never started a podcast, it's stored in one location and then pulled everywhere through what's called an RSS feed. You don't need to know what that means. It just means that your file is stored in one place 
And whether it's iTunes or Google Play or iHeartRadio or Spotify, they're all pulling it from one place. That media hosting company is your first option to fi figure out. They're all good now. There's really not a lot of bad ones. But if you go for a free one, you get what you pay for. So go with one of the ones that they're not. It's gonna, if you're doing an episode a month or a half hour, it's $5. It's not a lot of money. Forgo one coffee a month for that. You know, and be able to have the, the resource of a decent hosting site. And they'll make that easy for you to get it up. There are great resources for art, like Canva. There are great resources for editing little audiogram clips, like Headliner. They're all free, right? They, there's, high, there's ones you could pay for that add more features, but the basic resources are free. If you don't have an intro, if you don't want to do your voiceovers, Fiverr.com with two R's, you can find people that will do all of that stuff, the basic stuff to get your podcast to look somewhat professional so you can start for next to no money. But again... All of that means nothing if you're not passionate about podcasting. So you've got to first start with that. But also keep in mind, you may not want to do an interview podcast or a, a lifestyle podcast. In any field that you're in, having a podcast is just added value. If you're working as a restaurateur, that's what you want to be, become known as the podcast about restauranting. You know, if you are a piano player, whatever you are, you can use the podcast as added value that might lead to selling piano lessons or as for your restaurant, being a consultant for other restaurants or just driving people to your restaurant. Why do you think every comedian on the planet has a podcast? You think it's because they just love podcasting? No, it drives people to go see them. That's what they're using it for. So I am different. I use my podcast as my primary source of income. I'm not selling anything on it, but most podcasts have an ancillary revenue stream and that's why they're doing their podcast to sell seminars, to sell whatever. That's why they're doing their podcast. So there could be multiple reasons why you start a podcast. And I, I am like you. I think it's so it's the right thing for everyone to do. But keep in mind, not only do 90% of, of podcasters quit after episode three, of the 1 million podcasts, and that's not a fake number, it's probably more now, but roughly 1 million podcasts, 90% of them have less than 200 listeners. So you have to realize if you get to 300 listeners, you're in the top 10% of podcasting. That's pretty amazing, but you still have 100,000 other podcasts that you're competing with. So you have to realize that why that's, while that sounds daunting, go try and be an Instagrammer or a YouTuber where there's literally 100 million, if not a billion people that you're, that you're competing with, where a million listeners, if you have a million people on YouTube, it's not that great. It's fine. It's good. There's a people with 100 million, you know? But if, if you have a, a 100,000 people listening to you on a podcast, you can make a living from that. That's what's interesting about podcasting. Uh, Ralph, you're, you're saying so many things that I constantly preach to people. Um, I love the <laughs> breakdown. I love the breakdown of like the podcaster versus YouTuber versus influencer. Because that's something I've never really thought about, but it's kind of yeah, common think sense. About, like, think about the yeah. CPM rates. The CPM yeah. rate on TikTok is like a dollar per thousand CPM for those that don't mean cost per thousand M mm -hmm. is the Roman numeral for a thousand. It's the metric that everything is considered on for the internet. Right. Mm -hmm. So on, on TikTok, I think it's a dollar or two, you know, on, on YouTube, it goes up to four or five dollars. You know, Instagram, it's about five dollars as well on a good podcast. It could be as much as 15 or 20 dollars yeah. per thousand listeners. And then if you're also doing some sort of added value, like with a with a code that, you know, for you use, use my code to get a discount mm -hmm. you can make even more on the back end so with again there are podcasts that i deal with that have 20 30 000 listeners that are making a living from 20 30 000 listeners if it's the right segment of niche that where people are very passionate about it so that's what's fascinating to me about podcasting because it's a active listener versus a passive listener which I've, i'm a big um I, I try to hammer that home a lot for people what the, the example being radio, where you just turn it on, it's on in the background, or Spotify, you just hit play, and it's just playing. For a podcast, they have opened up their podcast app, they have typed in your name, and they have pushed play. That person really cares about what you're saying. So that audio listener relationship is much stronger than the TV show that just happens to be on in the background, or the radio station that's playing in the car, or the magazine they're thumbing through at the office to kill time. This is a very relationship. so that ROI for the advertiser return on investment is much higher. That's why that um, CPM rate is much higher. And that's why with 20,000 listeners, you could make a living where no other platform really 
matter if you're bragging about 20,000 listen 20,000 followers on YouTube, no one gives a shit. That's nothing. <laughs> you know, you need a million before they care about you. You know, so that's why I love podcasting so much. Totally, totally agree. Um, it's the only medium where you can have someone's undivided attention for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, and they could be doing, you know, other things. They could be driving, working out. Um, you know, I don't have to be sitting down in one place watching a YouTube video. So many distractions, my phone, people, people love listening to podcasts because, uh, you know, they just really love to learn. And, uh, I, I don't, I don't also argue that's the best way to teach as well. And, uh, We've spoken about building personal brand too. So my final question for you, Ralph, I've really enjoyed this conversation, but to that 20 something that has a podcast, you know, let's say they're on episode three um, and they need to be a little extra convinced, you know, to continue it um, mm -hmm. before getting to four, they don't, <laughs> they're thinking about quitting, uh, not continuing. What's your best advice to build a podcast uh, organically? Um, so well, they don't have to put up. Yeah. A couple of things. One consistency is key, right? So figure out what your release schedule is going to be. Is it once a week? Is it twice a week? Is it once a month? Whatever it is, you figure it out and you stick to it. I think also it should be shorter. People tend to think it should be longer, you know, because it's funny. I don't want to uh, uh, go on too long about this, but you know, the, the metric to what considered what's considered a listener has changed over time. Right? So Joe Rogan and those kind of podcasts that are very, very long, two, three hours, the reason is, which is kind of a funny story, is go back years ago, they saw when they were doing long episodes, they would get more listeners. So they all started to do longer episodes. But why that was, was that the metric was, if I listened to your three-hour podcast in six segments, it counted as six listens. It was one person listening six times, but they just were going through. So you didn't really, you weren't getting more listeners. But that's why those shows went long. And what happened is if you're used to listening to a podcast that's three hours, you can't just all of a sudden say, hey, guess what? I'm 40 minutes now. Your fans will be pissed off. So it's better to start short and then maybe add as you go. No one's going to be upset that you added 15 minutes. But boy, would they be upset if, they, if you cut a half hour. So start short. Start 25, 30 minutes. And that way, if you're short on time, you know, oh, an hour, we could bang out two real quick, big deal versus, oh, we need two hours, whatever. That's you know, so consistency and doing it, uh, uh, you know, figuring out a time that's feasible. Because keep in mind, most podcasts, the reason why they're about 45 minutes long, the most popular ones is people would listen to them to and from work and a common commute is about 45 minutes. So that's why they, they're about that time. So I recommend people less is more. That's, that's really the answer. Less is more. And realize that it takes a year, at least a year, before you find your rhythm and before people start finding you. And I'm sorry to keep going on, but obviously I'm very passionate about this. Of course, I so believe, please. <laughs> I use the term ABP, always be promoting. So I keep stickers by my door. Mm -hmm. I never leave my house without stickers. I consider every day a failure if I haven't gotten at least five people to subscribe through conversation on a regular daily basis. And I, the, the story that I've told a million times, I was on jury duty about three years ago. And at the end of that juror, jury duty, I had 11 new subscribers because all the other guys, I made them sign up to my podcast. And that's how you have to look at it. You have to live and breathe your podcast or it will go to the wayside. You have 100%. to think about it all the time. I love your always be promoting point. Um, you know, people look at the word distribution. They think, okay, that's just where I'm going to host my show. But I think distribution is like, you know, an individual who's going to talk about your show to other people. Um, you know, I'm really lucky I get to interview people like you whom, you know, if you end up enjoying this episode and want to share it with your listeners after uh, it goes live, I mean, that's going to allow me to get in front of a whole new audience that has no idea who I am. So that's a distribution that you always need to be um, curious about, you know, how to grow your show. Um, I think that podcasts, at least, you know, how I kind of run my podcast, I run it like a business, you know, every single day. I mean, since creating it, I think that you need to really create the right decisions. You know, you need to really get connected with the right people who can help your show grow uh, and be intentional, you know, really when building it up. Uh, a lot of people are just going to create a show for fun. But I mean, I think if you want to create something that has lasting impact, um, something with a strong mission, um, run, run it like a business. And that's completely fine uh, because it can lead to new and exciting business opportunities for sure. But, but having said that, there is nothing wrong with if you just want to do one for fun because yep. you enjoy talking, by all means, I mean, go ahead and do it. But I think it's a great, I think it's a great way to hang out with your friends, use it as an excuse to get together with some friends, you know, yep. you don't, it doesn't have to be a job. It can be just something you do for funsies and don't care if anyone listens. That's fine too. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. And you know, the podcasting, as you said earlier, the podcasting uh, market, it's still pretty small. I mean, there's so 
many opportunities for people to make a mark in this industry. Um, the person who might be the top podcast in the next five years, maybe doesn't even have a podcast yet. So I think that right. more people should create shows um, because, you know, you can really, really get a lot of value from creating a podcast. And Ralph, I'm really glad that I had an opportunity to speak with you on my show about your 20s, uh, your professional journey and your advice for young people when it comes to creating a podcast. So thank you. Oh, thanks for having me, my friend.